enjoy doing that. They, en they enjoy those kind, that kind of humor. And um, uh, they also um, meticulously keep their agreements. They're like Philadelphia lawyers that way. One, uh, one of the first agreements that I negotiated with them was that I would never come up behind them and scare them, and I asked them to never come up behind me and scare me. Uh, and and, and I, if, if, they, if they came and I, and I was working, I wanted them to make some noise or something so I knew they were there. And then the agreement was that I would stand in place when they approached me from the front or from a direction that I could see them. And then they could come in as close as they wanted. I wouldn't close the distance. I'd just stand there. And they could come in until they felt comfortable. And if they felt like leaving, I would never pursue. If they wanted to leave, if they felt they'd come in too close or they got nervous or something that they felt it was time for them to go, I would never pursue after them. And vice versa, if they were coming in on me, and I got nervous because they were getting too close, as in, the, uh, as in that short that episode I described uh, in The Wayward Whim, when the alien doctor was coming in on me and <laughs> freaked me out, that if I chose to start backing off, they wouldn't pursue. They would just stop and let, until we'd both agreed on a mutual distance. And they kept that meticulously, and of course they expected me to keep that meticulously too. And that's how they are. The agreement they had with the U.S. Air Force was that nothing I did would ever be classified, that I could tell anyone anytime I wanted. They expect the American generals to keep that to the letter. It isn't anything special about me. It's that once they've made an agreement, that's the agreement. If there weren't something in it for them, they wouldn't make the agreement. They don't, you're never forced to make an agreement with them. But once you make an agreement with them, Man, you, you know, the last thing you ever want to do is to break the agreement. Each one of them is different. Some are, some are humanistic, like the doctor. Their generals are what you expect a general to be. Each one is different. Uh, let's see here. Oh, let's see. I got a mouse here. There we go. Okay. In closing, I'd like to connect. I'd like to. Um, I'd like to quote a few things. This I'm quoting from Paula Harris in her nice book, Connecting the Dots. This is found on pages 46 and 47. In this page, she is interviewing Monsignor Corrado Belducci, who will be speaking here, I understand, uh, tomorrow. And Paula Harris asked him, can you quote some church fathers who suggest the existence of life on other planets? And Corrado Belducci replied, yes, there are several. Andre, and forgive me if I mispronounce the Italian names, Andrea Beldrimi, the Silesian father and servant of God, prayed for the inhabitants of other planets. And as you see, of the 16 books he wrote, one seems to deal with this topic, and the second was the recently sanctified Padre Pio. Um, Monsignor Corraldo Valducci continued quoting Padre Pio, we earthlings are nothing too. The glory of God, the, the, the Lord certainly did not limit his glory to this small planet. On other planets, other beings exist who did not sin and fall as we did. Then Paula Harris asked him, is it a grave mistake to think that you are the official voice of the Vatican? And Monsignor Balducci answered, these ideas are mine and I do not represent the Vatican. However, I'm told that the late Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, has seen me on Italian TV several times and follows my radio homilies. If there was some objection, I'm sure I would know. Based on that statement, I have the following observations. The situation today is kind of the reverse of the one that Galileo faced. Um, back then, in the time of Galileo, the church wanted everyone to think inside the box and scientists wanted to think outside the box. Now it's the reverse. Now the church is, and the philosophical ph philosophers and so on are willing to think outside the box. It's the scientists who, steep, who keep wanting us to think inside the box. It's the scientists who want to pretend that we can't travel faster than the speed of light when I routinely saw the deep spacecraft land having come here to Earth traveling faster than the speed of light. Uh, I never saw anything that would lead me to believe that aliens were supernatural 
that they seeded our planet. I never saw anything to believe that, that would lead me to believe that the tall whites wanted to create hybrids. They were very proud of the way they were, that there were wormholes in space, or that they traveled forward or backwards in time. However, their craft did routinely travel faster than the speed of light in making the deep space crossing. That I observed on many occasions. I've captured this. Now, I'm not going to talk about science today because I want to stay within my 50 minutes and I see I've got to hurry if I'm going to do it. Um, <clears throat> I want to speak, uh, in, but in book three, in the appendix, I have Hall photon theory. And I'll just show this slide to show that it's there. Um, to, and um, the basis of Hall photon theory is that I believe that inside the photon there's a third field. And there's an electric field, a magnetic field, and a third field that I call the starshine field. And I believe that if scientists were to study famous experiments, like the Michelson-Morley experiment, the Waterfield telescope experiment, what's happening in tor outside toroidal coils, that, the, the, that it would be very obvious that there was way more to physics than what they're looking at. And I describe that in my book. And, and, and um, the, the tall white spacecraft were, appeared to be, uh, the design of the tall white spacecraft knew about the existence of these other fields and used them in the design. The tall white spacecraft had an inner hull and an outer hull. And for example, and in between those two hulls were miles of fiber optic windings. Um, inside the scout, for the, in the small scout craft, for example, I one time estimated that there might have been a, as much as a thousand miles of fiber optic windings in between there. Melted fiber optics is, could be easily confused with the slag from an aluminum furnace. And you'll remember that Alan J. Hynek said he had like 500 samples of slag that had fallen off from flying saucers. And they were characterized as slag from an aluminum furnace. Fiber optics is typically 49% aluminum. You'll notice that in the previous um, presentation, they mentioned that fiber optics was ceramic with plastic around it. Well, that plastic melts at, what, 150, 160 degrees Fahrenheit. You'll see in book two, in the, day, in, in the chapter entitled The Day Without View, when I observed the scout craft, it had a meltdown, a meltdown of its fiber optics. And, those, and the aliens alone, without humans around, without the US Air Force or whatever, worked on that scout craft from like Wednesday afternoon till the following Monday morning, day and night. They played hell getting, that, getting it to work again. And when they finally got it working on Monday morning, two other scout craft came down and sat, you know, flew beside it to stabilize it while they nursed it back up to the main hangar to do more repairs on it. Uh, I, as far as I know, I'm the only human that got within a short viewing distance. I got within, I don't know, 100, 200 feet of it before their guard wouldn't let me get any closer. And what they were working on was fiber optics. And inside the deep space craft, as I describe in book three in the opening chapter, The Road Home, it had taken meteor damage. And, when, and it had the same construction, an inner hull and an outer hull. And then inside the inner hull, there was a row of, it was like a cruise ship. There was a row of, a row of rooms that obviously functioned as storage for supplies, boxes, and other things. And, and, then, and then inside that was another row of bulkheads. And then inside that was the living area. And when the meteor had come through, they had obviously, it had obviously struck the craft uh, just over the left running light up on top and had come down through at more or less a 45 degree angle and had just blasted its way through that l row of rooms where the, the, that were storage rooms and had just come in the top and gone out the bottom. And when they finally got that landed on, uh, at the Mount Charleston ski area in that snowstorm, as I describe in my books, man, that was just barely holding together. They had, they were in, they had the land. I've always felt that if the tall whites had had any other base area on the earth other than Indian Springs because of the storm that we were having at the time, that they would have put in somewhere else if they could have. But you know, they, 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 were, they had to land. They couldn't, they couldn't have stayed out in space. They told me even another two days, you know, for the, waiting for the storm to clear. And so that technology must be easily accessible for American scientists if they would start thinking about famous experiments like Michelson-Morley with an open mind. Michelson, the Michelson-Morley experiment, once you realize the photon has a third field, 
there's no reason whatever to believe in relativity and the, to believe that the arms of the, of the interferometer are shortening or anything. Now, I, I want to close up because I want to stay, you know, as close as I can to my time allotment, and I see I'm getting very close. Um, uh, um, I, I have just a few minutes for questions and answers, and then I'll, and then I'll close. You've been a wonderful audience. And, and as I describe in my book, in book three, I have personally seen two kinds, the tall whites at Indian Springs and the ones I call the Norwegians with 24 teeth in Madison, Wisconsin. The Norwegians with 24 teeth look so much like us that if my dentist hadn't pointed him out to me, I would have never guessed it. Now, humans are genetically coded for 32 teeth, as are all mammals. Some dinosaurs had 32 teeth. No mammal has ever had genetic coding for 24 teeth. However, in a 1949 U.S. Army study, something over 5,562 people were put to death in the German death camps in World War II that were rounded up from southern, from Norway, Denmark, Germany, and Poland, who were genetically coded for 24 teeth and had slightly webbed feet. And, and the, the ones that I, the, the young man and the young lady that I met in Madison, Wisconsin, and there was a third individual that I met in Cambridge. I didn't actually talk to the third individual. Uh, they all claimed to have come here from a nearby star, possibly Bernard's star or the next star out. And their description of that star in 1962 is consistent with what is known about those stars today. The next star out from Bernard's star, for example, is believed to have a system of at least five planets, is smaller than the sun, and is a brown, red, reddish brown dwarf. And in 1962, that is consistent with the description the young man gave me of his of the star that where his home planet orbited. Yeah. Uh, well, mm -hmm. I know some extraterrestrials, but I, I've never known them to be stationed here. Mm -hmm. I haven't met the tall whites. Oh. I have brief memories of them. Oh, I'm yes. I, I've met them. They're beautiful. Mm -hmm. They are beautiful. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Why are they here on Earth? See, I don't know that. Why are what? they here, or have they been here mm -hmm. for thousands of years? They use the base at Indian Springs, up in Area 54, for the same purposes that the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Navy use bases in the Pacific. They, they use them as a place for their deep spacecraft to put in, to refuel, to refurbish, and stand out to space again. They're typically in port for two weeks. They typically land at sundown on the night of the full moon, because they're trailing the Earth in its orbit. When at sundown, you're on the part of the Earth that's trailing in its orbit. And on the night of the full moon, the moon is opposite the sun, and you're looking at a gravitationally smooth gravity field. See, and the moon is moving away from you. So for them, it's like an, air, it's like an airplane coming in on an aircraft carrier landing, simple as pie. Then they stay in port for two weeks, and at midnight on the night of the new moon, then they take off. Now, at, at the night of the new moon, the moon is in between the Earth and the sun. And at midnight, you're on the side of the Earth, away from the sun. And if the moon is on the other side of the Earth on the night of the new moon, you're looking at a totally open field. There's nothing in front of you. And when the deep spacecraft powered up and took off, I mean, they powered up and took off. Now, I realize that they, th th that, um, you know, if they were in trouble or if they had an experienced pilot, sometimes you'd see the smaller deep spacecraft come in one or two nights before the new moon or before the full moon or one or two nights after the full moon. But the large ones, the ones that are the hardest to control or the ones with the new, new pilots, always came in very promptly, just like at an airport. You know, you could watch them land and take off. There were schedules to it. They had a, the, the smaller deep spacecraft were on a schedule of two, two months or two and a half months. A specific craft could take off from the Earth, go somewhere, I'm certain, to another star, and return in two or two and a half months. Now, if the nearest star is four light years away, that means that they were traveling, I don't know, 24, 25 times the speed of light, you know, which didn't seem at all. One time I mentioned that to them, and it didn't, didn't nobody flinched. It didn't seem at all like ho-hum to them. So, yeah, there, there was a, I saw a great deal that isn't uh, in my books or that I haven't had a time to c cover in this lecture. Sure. Do you have a clue on the nature of the fuel? Um, it's my understanding that there are five subatomic particles that are easy to produce. I'm not sure which five, but like mesons or whatever, 
that put out anti-gravity. And what they're doing is creating the particle. They're, they're building the sub